The reading is taken from James, James chapter 5, and this can be found on page 1150. James chapter 5, page 1150, and reading from verse 13 to 20. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you ill? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make them well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain. The earth produced its crop. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring them back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the way of error will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. This is the word of the Lord. Well, it's um, great to be with you again this morning. A welcome to you if you weren't here earlier um, on this rather quiet Sunday. It's, it's, what is really nice about these days, I live just close to the highway. I don't know if many of you do, but on these days where there's a, a marathon or where they have the cycling, it's, you wake up in the morning and go, Something, something's different. I hear birds singing. <laughs> It's quiet. It feels like I'm I'm in the countryside. It's amazing how much noise uh, the uh, the highway can produce. Generally, 24/7. I think it's one of the busiest A roads in London. So it's nice when it's quiet every now and again. Uh, for those of you who I haven't met, my name is Andrew. I'm one of the pastors here uh, with a specific task of overseeing the music and the worship and the creative stuff, uh, and also our evening service. But sometimes they, they let me speak as well. So um, hold on to your seatbelts. It's, it's going to be fun. Um, we are coming to the end of a series in our 11 and 6 uh, services, uh, which has been called I Life. Um, and just to quickly give you a, a, a summary, uh, we have been looking at how we live life in what is a rapidly changing world. Our culture is going through seismic shifts in the way it communicates, in the way that it learns, in the way that uh, it functions, all through digital technology. And we've been looking at various subjects around um, uh, Uh, Facebook and Google um, and consumerism. And today is the last one. And today we're going to be looking, kind of bringing everything together by looking at what it means to be in the church or I church. What does it mean to be in community? I guess maybe we could drop the I. I'm not quite sure if we could do that because it's we church, really. Don't know if that really works or not. Um, And I guess the the, the fundamental point is that we, as Christians, those who are the people of God, are invited into relationship. And that goes against everything that is fake, everything that is superficial, everything that kind of, the dangers that can be part of being in a digital generation. I don't know if you saw this um, article in the BBC uh, dating back to February of this year. The uh, title of the article said this, Fake Girlfriend, I Paid for a Make-Believe Love on Facebook. Um, I'll just read you a few few details. 24-year-old Sophia is smart, pretty, and has hopes and dreams of getting to grad school. And for $5, she will be your girlfriend. (laughs) It's not a big deal, really, she says, at the end of what has been an altogether very peculiar week. It's just easy to do. I just tick in a relationship. 
Sophie is one of the many women and a few men who have essentially bought the age-old in, age industry of escorting to the world of social networking. So basically, the premise is, is that, that guys and some girls will go in and they will pay to have a girlfriend on their Facebook page. Unbelievable. And I think the reason that they want to show on their Facebook page that they're in a relationship, they, there are various reasons. One of them is to make other girls jealous. Apparently, that's, that's what it is. But this is the kind of fake world that the digital world can invite us into. And one person that has been a victim of this was a, a well-known U.S. college footballer called Manti Teo uh, in the U.S. Uh, he made headlines um, recently. Um, I think I was actually in America at the time. Uh, and he was, he was a victim of a cruel fake Facebook hoax uh, where he dedicated a win to a girl he believed to be 22-year-old Stanford University graduate who had been in a serious car accident in California before being di diagnosed with leukemia. But when two journalists... Uh, did some research, they found that the girl didn't exist. His club, um, Notre Dame, said the player had been duped by an online and phone romance. These are some of the dangers of being in a, a world which is superficial, which, um, which is not, it's not real, it's not face-to-face, -face, it's not physical, it's something else. And I don't want to say that this, the new culture that we live in is all bad. It has amazing possibilities and there are amazing advantages to, to having digital devices and the information that, that we have access to. But we need to be aware that it impacts us at every level, even when we don't understand it. And that's where we need wisdom. Wisdom. Wisdom to know how we live in this culture, like we need to know wisdom in every culture. And this is what James is all about. The book of James is about wisdom. It's applying the truth of the gospel, the truth of who Jesus is, into worldly wisdom. It's not just about information. Some of you may have heard my talk a few weeks ago when I looked at Google. And uh, uh, there was a, there was some research has been done by a centre called Sintef, which produced information that said that 90% of all the data, 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 I can't, I never know how to say it in here, over here, uh, all the 90% of all the information the human race has ever produced has been generated in the past two years, 90%. The explosion is due to the rise of the web, smartphones, social media, and the big data projects in which businesses, governments, and scientists are involved. 90% of all information has been produced in the last two years. I mean, we are in the, a world of masses, masses, masses of information. We are bombarded with information all the time. But information is not wisdom. Information does not equal wisdom. Information just equals knowledge, or information just equals lots of information. But it's wisdom that is able to use that information and turn it into something which is wise. And James is communicating through his letter here that it's in Jesus and in the Christian community that we find wisdom. And this is really interesting here. So James is finishing. This is his last kind of passage. He's signing off here. And what does he say? He says that wisdom is not worked out in isolation. Wisdom is not found in isolation. Wisdom is found in the context of relationship. And that is the invitation for us today. The invitation for us through James here is to one of, uh, of relationship. Verse 13 says this. Let's open our Bibles. We'll stick uh, closely to it. Verse 13 says, Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. I think what we can learn from this is that God is interested in our everyday life. God wants to hear from us. If we're sad, he wants to know. If we're happy, he wants to know. 
In other words, God is interested in our every being. He wants to hear from us. He wants to do life with us. He is interested in the emotions of our life. Now, I know that might be difficult for some of you, particularly British. We like the stiff upper lip kind of, kind of you know, there's this kind of, I'm fine, thank you very much, and onwards and upwards. I don't, I don't know if that's fair. Am I, am I caricaturing it all here? Maybe not. I apologize. <laughs> But I want to say that God is interested in our emotions. He's interested in our emotions. So if we're happy, we can sing songs. If we are struggling, if we're in pain, he wants to hear from us. He wants to hear our lament. And I, I look at David, the great king and psalmist, where many of his songs are songs of lament. The thing is about Christianity is that we are not invited into a religion, into rules. We're invited into something very different. We're invited into a relationship. I was talking with a young man just this week who became a Christian on the last Alpha course. I want to say, if you haven't done the Alpha course or if you know people who you would like to invite to the next Alpha course, do. Bring them along. It's wonderful. Such a good way for people to learn about the Christian faith, to ask questions and, and make a discipleship journey to following Jesus. And I sat down with this young guy who became a Christian on the last course and I just said, remember, remember this is not about religion. This is not about just ticking lots of rules. This is about a relationship. It's about a relationship with God. God is concerned about your everyday life. He wants to talk to you. He wants you to listen. He wants to hear your heart. It's like a marriage. If I, with, with Megan, my wife, if I didn't communicate with her, I wouldn't be in relationship with her. Or, or it would, if I was, it would be some very, very weird relationship indeed. For any relationship to flourish and grow, it takes conversation, it takes communication. And so verse 16, the end of verse 16, it says, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Here's the other thing is that we, I read that and I go, oh my goodness, well, I've just got to be more righteous because I want to be effective. I want to be one of those people who prays that prayer with a low voice of authority and everything I pray just becomes reality. You know, a little bit like, you know, Bishop Richard Charters, if you've ever heard his voice. I don't quite have his voice. I'm not trying to. Anyway. So I want to be that righteous prayer, you know. So the reality is, is that our righteousness is found through Jesus. It's in Jesus that we find our righteousness. It's not about whether we are doing the right things. We can come to God day or night, whether we are struggling, whether we have sinned or not. If we're doing well, we come to him through Christ who offers us righteousness. And we can come right and pray through Christ to God who hears us. And if God hears us, I believe that that's an effective prayer. We are invited into relationship with God through Jesus through Jesus. And so I want to encourage you. Open up the lines of communication. With all the information that is floating around today and all the distractions and all the things that we can get sidetracked with, make sure that our, 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 our primary and first line of communication is with God. James says that that is wisdom. We are invited into relationship with God. Secondly, wise living is living in relationship with others. Living in relationship with others. We are invited to live and spend time with others like we are today. We see this firstly in verse 14, if you've got your Bibles open. Is anyone among you ill? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. You know what I find interesting about this? It's physical presence. You can't lay hands on somebody and pray and anoint them with oil through Facebook. I anoint you with oil through Facebook or I'm gonna text you an anointing of oil or whatever it is. You, you can't, now, I'm not saying that you can't pray for people. We were doing that. 
But what James is saying here is there is something physical going on. We are invited into physical relationship. It's a hands-on relationship. That's what it means to be the body. We need to see one another. We need to be able to, to look at one another, to talk with one another, be physically present with one another. That's why coming to church is so important. That's why it's great to be here with you this morning. That's why it's so important to be in connect groups. If you're not in a connect group, I encourage you, grab a blue form at the back of church, fill it out, or come and speak to me after that, and I can point you in the right direction. It's connect groups that will provide you the way to be in physical communication. Let's go down to verse 16. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. We are invited into honest one-to-one relationship. That is the invitation. We've got a very physical relationships going on down here. One-to-one. The reality is, is that we are invite, we are called to be accountable to one another. What does, what does James say here, verse 16? It says, confess your sins to one another. Confess your sins to one another that you may be healed. I w- I've been in a, an accountability group with two other guys for pretty much the whole time I've been here at St. Paul's for seven years. And we were sitting down and we were reflecting on our relationship just a couple of weeks ago. And we were, both, uh, we were all saying that it's been that relationship, the relationship of meeting weekly and looking one another in the eye and saying, how are you doing? What are you up to? What's God saying to your life? Where are you sinning? It's those questions. How are you reading the Bible that have protected us, that have kept us safe from falling or from from going off track, but also encouraged us to step into things that we've been called into, to mature and grow in our Christian faith, in our, in our, um, our work life. There is something really powerful about confession, There is something very powerful about being able to share with one another. And James says that when we confess our sins to one another, when we don't hide it, that we're healed. Why? Because I think the devil wants us to live in secrecy. See, if if there are things in our lives which are not exposed, they're held in. Now we may say, yes, I confess to God, but they're still there. The devil's just, he can say, yes, but I know who you really are. I don't know if you've ever found this. And you, you struggle with guilt and pain and condemnation. And what James is saying here is, confess your sins to one another that you might be healed. And then verse 19 and 20, my brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander away from the truth and someone should bring them back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the way of error will save them from death and cover a multitude of sins. The reality is, is being with one another is instructive. It teaches us. We learn together. We grow together. We guide one another. We farm one another. We encourage. You know, your life, by being with other people, just by being who you are, can lead others. You are called, we are called to be role models. How are you being a disciple maker? We're in this season, this year of making disciple makers. I ask you afresh and anew, who are those people that you are making disciples? Who are you making a disciple makers of? That's the invitation we are called to. But the challenge, and I think this is the real challenge for us in this context, is it's an invitation to submission and humility. You see, in the digital world where we have many options and where we can choose to check in and check out, we can communicate at our own leisure, we can set up facades, we can be plastic, we can, basically what we are doing is we are removing any sense of authority We can say, I'm not going to listen to that voice. I'm going to choose this voice. I'm going to read that blog or I'm going to ignore that blog or whatever. We are offered choice. And what's happened is there is no authority. But when we're invited into the community of the church, we are invited to submit to one another and humble ourselves to one another. And that's not easy. It's not easy to hear from from somebody else to say, hey, Andrew, you need to sort that out in your life. You need to fix that up. That's not quite, I'm observing this. Or you're not stepping into things. You need to be stepping up or whatever it is. 
It's not easy to hear that, but we need it. And it means that we need to humble ourselves to one another. We need to submit ourselves to one another. And so finally, we see here in James is that wise living, living in the context of community, living in relationship with God and with one another leads to life. I want to just quickly invite John up. John, can you come up? A big hand for John. And John's been on an amazing journey, and um, I'm just going to ask him a few questions about that journey. Um, so, John, how are you, mate? Uh, you're, 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 yeah, you, it's going to be fine. Um, now, you, you, uh, you came here how long ago to St. Paul's? Uh, uh, oh, about six, 18 months ago, 19 months ago, something like that. And j- without going back too far, just tell us a little bit of your story leading up to, to, to coming into St. Paul's. Into St. Paul's, uh, well, I didn't know St. Paul's. Uh, I moved from where I lived originally in Manor Park and I was uh, put in, I come to move to Whitechapel for certain reasons. Um, I, through my life, I become a, a drug addict, alcoholic uh, for, for 29 years. I was an active addict and in criminality. Uh, eventually, I uh, found my only way out. I attempted suicide, hence my uh, me walking on crutches to, uh, today. I found uh, old help in a Christian rehab. They took me in and uh, basically showed me the way to, to to find Jesus. And I did there, and then I found St. Paul's, and it's, it's, yeah, it's dramatically changed my life around. So did you move to, so you met these people, were you still in Manor Park at the time? Yeah, 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 I was still there and then they took me, took me away from the, the pain basically that I, that I lived in and uh, took me and turned my life around. And so you, you, you moved to East London and how did you find St Paul's? Uh, for a friend, a friend told me about it, they said why don't you come to church, I'll go down to St Paul's and I sort of went, well I'll give it a go. Because yeah, I was scared. I was never, I was never brought up with faith or anything. You know, what I mean, it wasn't spoken about in in the house, in in my family life. And I come here, and yeah, I was nervous, scared to come through the doors, basically, because I wondered that everyone was going to judge me. Hmm. You know what I mean, of who I was and what I was about. But it was completely different. <laughs> everyone here yeah, accepted me with open arms. A few people that I spoke to, I spoke to Rod and Rick and explain my story to them and yeah they wel- welcomed me and accepted me for who I am and not what I was you know what I mean and people in I uh, come to the 11 o'clock service every Sunday and yeah, yeah people have been amazing it's really been amazing it's a wonderful journey and I'm still on it you know what I mean and yeah I'm really happy yeah, it's amazing John it's great to have you here and it's, I want to ask you uh, one more question so how has Jesus, and being in the context, so knowing God, knowing Jesus, and knowing this community changed your life? Have you got two hours? Almost. No, it's made me a lot of better person. I can understand things. I don't, I live, I, or I, I try to live in, in God's will and not my, my will, because I lived in my will all the time. And it, yeah, I'm learning every day to, to accept the things and the people. I've joined a connect group since I've been here and I've got so many new new friends and it's yeah. just yeah, it's just a wonderful it's a, a wonderful new life for me and I wouldn't have done it without without everybody that I know here. Rick and Rod, they've helped me a lot. You know what I mean? So yeah, it's been just yeah, it's just amazing. I just feel so so yeah. good and yeah, I'm proud to be part of, of St Paul's. Well, it's lovely for you to be part of us, as part of the church, part of the body. Big hand for John. Isn't that amazing? Bless you, mate. What a great story. And basically, John uh, has given my talk. So uh, that's it. That is it. Is that when we're invited into community, we encounter life 
through Jesus and the Spirit is that God changes us. He heals us. He heals us. And that's what Peter, uh, James says here. So we are saved. We are saved from sin and we can know healing, physical healing, emotional healing, spiritual healing. It's profound. It's profound. And so Jesus says in John 10, 10, I have come to give you life and life to the fullest. That's the invitation that we can know. We can encounter God. and We encounter one another. We are the body of Christ. You know that we encounter God as we, we gather together as the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. That's profound. And we wanna see more and more people like John. I'm sure you know stories. You've probably have stories of your own of how you have been helped and healed and saved by being part of Christian community. That's the invitation to be in community. And that is being in Christian community enables us to live with life and with wisdom. To live in a world that is always changing, cultures that are always moving. But God gives us wisdom no matter what the situation and what the circumstance. And so there are, there, I'm sure there might be different applicable points for you today. But all I would say in conclusion is this, is, is one, to make sure that you are living in relationship with God. And if you are not, you've been sitting here today and go, I'm not quite sure I know God. I'm not in this relationship with Jesus. That I encourage you, today is your day to open a relationship with God. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you, James says. Maybe for you, you're not in community. You, you're not in a connect group and then in a small group of people who can look you in the eye and say, how are you doing? I encourage you today, get in one. That's wise living. And thirdly, I would say, open your eyes, be aware of what the culture presents us with, both the problems and the challenges, the pitfalls, the dangers, but also in wisdom, the possibilities. Because God calls us to be wise people living in the context that we've been placed.